Well, good morning. Good morning. And please do have your Bibles open at uh, that passage from uh, John chapter 15, on page 1,083. A man was out in town when he received a rather bewildering text from his wife one day, which said, what do you want out of life? <coughs> and he was rather perplexed, and he thought, is there, is there a problem here? Is there something wrong with my marriage? What on earth is she trying to tell me? He then received another message, which blamed predictive texting on the previous one, and said, what I meant to say is, what do you want out of little? <laughs> but it's a good question. What do you want out of life? What are your goals? What are you looking for for satisfaction in life? And what at the end of it all, will you look back and say, that was really worth it all? Well, we're not far into a new year now, and uh, January is often a time when we begin to take stock of our lives, what has happened in the past, where we're heading in the future, and to think about our plans and our goals for the year ahead. What are your goals for 2019? Well, John 15 gives us not just a, a goal for a year, not just a goal for 2019, but a goal for life. And it's summed up in verse 8 of our passage. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Unfortunately, of course, most of the goals that we set ourselves, most of our New Year's resolutions, that we haven't already broken them, are very much to do with ourselves. We, we are inherently self-absorbed because we live in a, in a me-first culture where we are at the centre of everything. We've been looking over these last three weeks now at the, uh, the example that Jesus sets us. In the hours before his death, as he met with his friends in this borrowed upper room, and his main concern, despite the fact he was shortly to face a cruel and agonising death. His main concern as he met with his friends was to teach them and to encourage them, to strengthen them and to prepare them for what lay ahead after he was gone. His focus was very much on them and on their needs. This passage is what has become known as the upper room discourse. Jesus' last words to his disciples before his death. Words that are therefore very precious indeed. What John Stott has called the inner sanctuary of the New Testament. Now there's some dispute among the scholars as to exactly where this teaching in John 15 took place. They had clearly been in the upper room. But at the end of chapter 14 and verse 31, Jesus says to his disciples, Come now, let us leave. And I think it's probably quite likely at that point that they left the upper room and headed out of Jerusalem, down the hillside, <coughs> across the Kidron Valley, into the Garden of Gethsemane, where in chapter 18, Jesus is betrayed by Judas and arrested by the authorities. Jesus often taught his disciples as they walked along together on the road in the open air, not something we do very much in this country. And as they would have walked down from the upper room where it's situated, and as they walked down the hillside towards the Kidron Valley, they would have seen the temple over to their left. And on the entrance to the temple, they would have seen a large golden <coughs> bike, which Jesus may well have used as a visual aid for that part of his teaching. The vine, you see, was the symbol of Israel, as well as a large emblem on the entrance to the temple. During the period, the, the, the Maccabean period, they call it, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, and before the Roman occupation, the Israeli coinage had the symbol of the vine on one side. And all through the Old Testament, there are many references to the vine and to Israel being the vineyard of God. 
And in verse 1 of John 15, Jesus says something which would have been truly shocking to Jewish ears listening at that time. It is the last of the great I am's, these quite astonishing claims by Jesus about himself. Claims to eternity. Claims to deity. We looked just a couple of weeks ago at possibly the most famous of all when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Quite astonishing. And in many ways quite shocking. And this one is no less shocking, although it may well appear, not appear to be, uh, to us. When Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. What Israel should have been, and failed to be, Jesus is. And here Jesus is claiming to be the, the true Israel, the true vine of God. You see, God had chosen the nation of Israel to be his special people to be his vineyard, to be his conduit, if you like, through which his blessing would flow to all the nations round about. In Isaiah 5, verses 1 to 2, it says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest of vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Israel rebelled against God, refused to listen to him, to follow his laws, refused to be the conduit of his blessing to other nations. And so God acted in judgment, using the neighboring, nation, neighboring nations of Assyria and Babylon. And he says in verse 5 of Isaiah 5, Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. And just in case you were in any doubt as to who the prophet Isaiah is referring to here, he makes it very clear in verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. God's vineyard, Israel, was chosen to bear fruit for him. But it spectacularly failed and produced only bad fruit. The great theme of John 15, as we've already been thinking about, is, is fruit and being fruitful <coughs> for God. The word is mentioned, I think, nine times or thereabouts, depending on what translation you're using. But what is this fruit that we are meant to show in our lives? And how do we produce this fruit for God? Well, whilst we have in Galatians chapter 5 a list of the fruits of the Spirit that Matt was referring to earlier on, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control... It, it would seem that the fruit that Jesus is really talking about here, and, and which would certainly encompass all of these things, is really becoming more like our Lord and Saviour. More like Jesus. Having his character formed in us. The fruit that we are meant to show is a changed life. A life that will show to an unbelieving world that we are his, that we belong to him that we are his disciples. And as we are connected to the vine, to the source of life, through faith in Jesus, and as we allow the vibrancy of his life to flow through us and out towards others, then God in his goodness does a work in our lives to make us more like his son, the Lord Jesus, reflecting his character and his priorities. And then we will produce the sort of fruit that God is looking for. But the really important thing to make sure that we grasp hold of this morning is that we can only bear fruit for God, we can only have this changed life by being in relationship with Jesus. 
the branch cut off from the tree that Matt showed couldn't bear any fruit because it wasn't connected to the source of life. Only if we are connected to him, like the branches of the vine are connected to the vine itself, and the life of the vine flows through them, can we bear fruit. Now that is something that would have been received with absolute am amazement by any Gentile listeners on that occasion. Although Jesus was in fact speaking to the disciples. But even overhearing that, the Gentiles would have been absolutely amazed by this because they would automatically have assumed that because they were not part of the nation of Israel, they could never be connected to the vine, could never be connected to God in that way. And it would have been equally shocking to the Jew listening on that day because they would have assumed that they were already and automatically part of the vine by simply being part of the nation of Israel. And actually that same confusion still applies today. Many assume because of their lifestyle, because of the things they know they've done wrong, that they are excluded from any possibility of being in a relationship with God. But many others assume that simply by going to church and reading their Bibles, they are automatically in relationship with God. But neither is the case. And Jesus teaches here that we only bear fruit from God, which is what we are all created to do by virtue of our relationship with Jesus. A relationship that comes from being restored and forgiven and reconciled to a holy God through Jesus' death and resurrection. And that relationship is available to all who turn to him in repentance and in faith. The imagery here is very obvious, isn't it? If we're disconnected from the source of life, there's no way that we can produce the fruit that God is looking for. But the positive to that is that if we are in Christ, connected to him and allowing his life to flow through us, then we will bear much fruit for him. Our lives will be changed to be more like that of the Lord Jesus. Even though for many of us that is a long and slow process. Now I think it's important at this point to pause and just to address the concern that might be raised, uh, raised here from verse 2. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well every branch that does bear fruit he prunes or cleans so that it will be even more fruitful. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. Does that mean that if we put our trust in Jesus, if we come to him in faith, if we become Christians, that if we bear no fruit, we will lose our salvation? Well, no, it doesn't. Just look what Jesus said just earlier on in John chapter 10. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And he's going to reinforce that, that. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The wonderfully reassuring thing for us is that God will keep those who are his. He won't let them be lost. Because it's not down to us and our performance. If that were the case, then we would be in difficulty. But it's not. It's all down to him. So who then do these branches that are being cut off refer to? Well, I think it refers to those who give every outward sign <coughs> that they are believers. But there's no reality in the relationship. Rather than bearing fruit which comes from the life of the vine, they show what appears to be fruit. But it's simply like our Christmas decorations a month or so ago stuck on to the branches and not deriving its life from the tree. Jesus may, of course, here have been directly referring to Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, who had been with Jesus all through his earthly ministry, but who was just about to betray him and hand him over to the authorities. And, of course, there are many today who give every outward sign of belonging to Christ. They come to church regularly. 
They take an active part. They give every indication of being a Christian. But there's no inner reality. No inner connection to the Lord Jesus. And Jesus himself said that when he comes back, on that day when he comes back, that many will turn to him and say, Lord, I did this in your name, or I did that in your name. And he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? But in verse 3, Jesus tells the disciples, and he tells us today, if we know him as our Saviour and our Lord, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. As we have responded in faith to Jesus, the living word of God, God has made us clean. We call that justification. We are cleansed. We are forgiven. We are clothed in the very righteousness of the Lord Jesus himself. And we are declared by a holy God to be clean in his sight because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. But then there is that ongoing cleaning or pruning. The word actually uh, in verse 2 that we have translated pruning derives from the same word in verse 3 translated clean. So it can also be read as, as cleaning. That ongoing cleaning in our lives. We call that sanctification. That work of the Holy Spirit in our lives cleaning us and increasingly making us more like our Lord and Saviour. So on one hand God declares us to be clean if we've trusted him for salvation and sees us as clean in his sight but at the same time there is an ongoing process whereby we are continually made more clean through the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And however slow that process might be, however feeble the results of it might seem to us, those who belong to him will bear some fruit. And I want to, just in the short time we have left, just to focus on how then we can enable that fruit to grow more abundantly. The other key word in these verses we read together, which you will no doubt have noticed, is the word remain. I think it's mentioned some 11 times. Remaining in Jesus. And remaining in Jesus in three very important ways. Remaining in his word, remaining in his power, and remaining in his love. Firstly then, remaining in his word, verse 7 tells us, if you remain in me, my, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. As a church, I think you'll have noticed, we take the, the Bible, the word of God, very seriously. It is the predominant way in which God speaks to his people today. And as such, we need to remain in it. What does that mean? Well, we need to, to read it, to study it, to meditate on it. Not just as we come on a Sunday morning, important though that is, but regularly on a daily basis. And most important of all, we need to be obedient to it. Obedience to God's commands, as they are revealed to us in his word, it is the key to fruitful Christian living. And we see that in verse 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Notice, not if you keep my commands, you will earn my love. We could never earn God's love. He freely gives it to us. But as we respond to his love, a love that was clearly demonstrated by Jesus dying on the cross and taking upon himself the punishment that we deserved for our sin and rebellion against the Holy God, then we do so with hearts overflowing with thankfulness and by being obedient to his word. The psalmist could say, I rejoice in following your statutes. I meditate on your precepts. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Can we say that? Do we delight in God's word? Do we make time to read it on a, <clears throat> on a regular basis? And do we ask God to help us by his Holy Spirit to understand it and to be obedient to it in our lives? Paul writing to Timothy, that young pastor in the church of Ephesus 
could say in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Getting into God's word on a Sunday, yes, is important, but also in our own devotions and quiet times, doing it on a regular basis is really important. Now I recognise that that can be very difficult in our very busy and very pressurised lives. And we might wonder, well, where should we start? And how much we should we read? Well, there are many guides and, and uh, things to help us to get into God's Word. There are reading programmes and study guides and so on. And I'll just put a few things uh, here, and I've got a few things in my bag. Things that I found to be particularly helpful. So Jenny and I use a Bible reading scheme called Encounter with God, uh, which takes us through different parts of the Bible. Short Bible reading and then some commentary on it. And, and this is a series of stuff that's just recently been produced by Keswick Ministries. They're called uh, Food for the Journey. The idea is that you can read them on the train, you can have them in your pocket, your handbag, uh, use it at a particular time of day. And again, they're, they're undated devotionals, 30-day devotionals, so you can use them at any time. Uh, and again, there's a, there's a short Bible reading and then a commentary. That, actually, what it does is it re repurposes, I think is the, is the modern word. It takes some of the stuff that's been used uh, in, in Keswick uh, of, of past years and uh, puts them into a format that can be read over a period of 30 uh, days with the Bible reading. This one here is on Numbers, and it's Christopher Wright that does uh, that. I'll leave these at the back so you can have a look at them, and uh, obviously if you wanted any of these, I can uh, get them uh, for you. But why don't we take time over coffee at the end, instead of discussing yesterday's uh, football results, to discuss what Bible reading material we found to be helpful and useful for us to share with one another and to encourage one another in this very important area. But secondly, we remain in Jesus by remaining in his power. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I wonder if we really believe that. Because so often in our lives we don't live in that way. But fruitful, fruitful Christians acknowledge that they can't exist without him and his power. They can't understand God's word or be obedient to God's commands without his help. That was very much the focus of last week's service as we thought about how Jesus comforted his disciples who were saddened but by the thought of his imminent departure with the fact that he would send them his Holy Spirit to be their comforter, to help them, and to lead them into all truth. And that dependence on Jesus, on his life and power flowing through us, reveals itself in our prayer life. Prayer to our Heavenly Father is the thing more than anything else that shows that we are continually dependent on him and in need of his guidance and his strength and his power not trying to do things in our own strength which we are so, so prone to do and which is doomed to fail but trusting in him and relying on him let me ask you the question how is your prayer life as an individual in your family and corporately how is our church prayer life I think like the school report card of old, it's probably a case of could do better. It's a real challenge for us. But prayer is the powerhouse of the Christian and the powerhouse of the church. And we neglect it at our peril. So let's make prayer in 2019 a regular part of our daily routine. And let's make sure that the church prayer meeting is our first priority to attend and not the last priority as it so often appears to be. Do you notice the words of Jesus at the end of verse 7? If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. That's a very bold and surprising statement, isn't it? 
And it's not a throwaway comment here either. He's already told them the same thing on a number of previous occasions, like in the Sermon on the Mount. But what does it mean? Does it mean we can have that new Ferrari that we might have set our hearts on? Well, no, of course not. But it means that if we are being truly obedient to his word and relying on his power, then our priorities and our desires will change more towards his priorities and desires. We will be praying, as in the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. And our focus will be on God and his kingdom and not on ourselves. We'll be more in tune with God's will for us and God's will for our church. And our prayers will then reflect that and God will hear and will answer them. So fruitful, living fruitful lives for God involves remaining in his word and remaining in his power. And then finally and then briefly, remaining in his love. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. What does it mean to remain in God's love? Well, Wallace Ben, the retired Bishop of Lewis, and a, a recent speaker at Derby Bible uh, uh, Week, writes, Remaining in his love means basking in the wonderful love of Calvary, day in and day out. As Christians, we can never move far from the cross, for there we see the wonder of the love of Christ for us. That's why we regularly celebrate communion at this church. As we remember all that Jesus has done for us. <coughs> when he satisfied the wrath of a holy God. The wrath of God against sin. By paying the price and taking the punishment that was rightfully ours. It would only of course be on the other side of Calvary. That the disciples would truly understand the enormity of God's love for them. Understand the full extent of it. But we are in that <coughs> blessed position today. We worship at his feet. Where wrath and mercy meet. And a guilty world is washed by love's pure stream. They were to rejoice in this love. A love that showed itself primarily on the cross. But also in other ways too. It showed itself in the relationship that Jesus had with his disciples. Whereby he called them friends. Whereby he... He explained to them everything about his father's wonderful plan for salvation. Today he calls us friends as well. It was a love that was demonstrated by him explaining to them the wonderful assurance they could have. The wonderful knowledge they could appreciate that they've been chosen by Almighty God to be his children and to know the security and peace that derives from that in an uncertain and hostile world. And we too can know that same peace and comfort by basking in his love. So if we want to be fruitful disciples of our Lord, we need to remain in his love, in his word, by being obedient to it. We need to remain in his power through dependent prayer. And we need to remain in his love by basking in the love of Calvary. And if we do these things, which we only do with God's help, then we will bear much fruit, showing ourselves to be disciples of the Lord Jesus and bringing glory to God the Father. Let's make that our goal for 2019. And just imagine what a difference that would make in our lives as individuals, within our families, within our church, and also as we seek to reach out into our neighbourhood of, of Oakwood with the good news of the gospel. Let's ask God to help us by his spirit to increasingly bear fruit for him. I'm going to sing our final song. It's a song that expresses that desire to know the Lord Jesus more and to reflect him more in our lives. We'll stand together to sing it and then I'll close with a, a simple benediction afterwards. Knowing Jesus, there is no greater thing.